Shalom from Jerusalem, and welcome to the second part of our conversation with uh, Reserve Brigadier General Relic Shafir of the Israeli Air Force. This is Watchmen Talk, a series of conversations with Israeli military and security experts and practitioners. I'm Amir Owen. Relic, welcome again. Thank you. Now, about eight years after you graduated from the uh, Air Force Academy, the Flight Academy, you took part in uh, one of the most notable operations of the IAF ever, and that is uh, OPERA, the bombing of the uh, Iraqi nuclear reactor uh, at Osirak, uh, outside of uh, Baghdad. You and uh, seven other pilots were chosen for this mission. How and why were you, out of everyone there, um, in the base or in other squadrons, uh, were chosen? Um, at the time, about a year prior to that, when the uh, uh, Air Force was given the opportunity to purchase the F-16s, the Iranian F-16s, um, the first group of four pilots uh, were chosen according to the fact that there was a squadron commander, two deputies, and the Air Force commander at the time, David Ivory, said, I want the fourth pilot in the team to be an F-15 pilot. I well remember the ceremony at Ramad David, July of 1980, the first F-16s arrived. Yes, but when they selected the pilots, they wanted an F-15 pilot, a young F-15 pilot, who can bring the knowledge in air-to-air, -air, and not just the knowledge, but also the philosophy of the uh, first F-15 uh, squadron to the F-16s. And uh, lucky enough, I was uh, at the right place at the right time, and I was selected to join that team. So I was one of the uh, first four pilots who were trained in Utah at Hill Air Force Base. We came back in June, and then, uh, just like you mentioned, in July, I was the master of ceremonies in that particular event. And we set up the first squadron, the uh, 117 Squadron. And immediately after a few months, uh, we started training for the uh, Osirak uh, mission, even though we did not know at the beginning that this was the mission. What did you know? Um, we, I was in charge of air-to-air -air training and, and, and doctrines, and my friend Hagai Katz was in charge of air-to-ground, and we did all kinds of uh, trials and missions, and a long-range mission, range mission to see the uh, how far the airplane can go, what are the distances, and how to do the, uh, uh, the, the, the attack itself. Um, and one should mention two important features which now are common, we're not the stealth and uh, refueling, we're not uh, at the yes, time. Yes, we didn't have any stealth airplane, could not refuel uh, either F-15s or F-16s, and the uh, um, refueling F-4s would require, uh, it was too dangerous in enemy territory, and the F-16 could do the uh, uh, the mission, uh, not from our base, but from another base, uh, back and forth in a low, low, high uh, profile, as we call it, uh, which means fly low level, make the attack, egress, and then climb the high level to save fuel. Did you guess the target? No, I, I was, we were not aware and there are many people say, yeah, they knew it. I don't think anybody knew until we were told one day in training, and I think it was the beginning of December 1980, that this was the mission. We signed a piece of paper of secrecy, and uh, we were already um, working in the same formations at the time. My wingman was Ilan Ramon, and um, then we began the actual training for the particular mission. So, uh, and then we trained for about half a year. We would do a training mission every two weeks. You were the youngest pilots in the group? Elon was the youngest. I was second youngest. We were the only pilots who did not take uh, an operational part in the uh, 73 war. And we were placed at the back, number seven and eight. Uh, I was at the time deputy commander of the second F-16 squadron. Um, and so uh, we trained for that for six months, which is extraordinary because usually uh, fighter pilots, you know, you get your commands within a few hours, 
you go. And here we had six months to think about it, train about it, and uh, so on. Were there also training casualties while you were preparing for the mission? Yes. On the day I became second deputy, 20th of January, 1980, uh, there were six, we were six pilots in the second squadron with about 20 airplanes and ready to start a new uh, class for uh, F-4 and fear pilots. And that the morning I came in, as because I was commanding the uh, um, the flight group in the first uh, squadron, so I came in about two months after the squadron was set up. And on that morning, 9.05, there was a collision between an F-4 and an F-16 flown by the uh, deputy commander. Udi Ben Amitai. Udi Ben Amitai was killed on the spot. This is the son of a colonel in the artillery and the nephew of the deputy defense minister. True. He, at the time, his father was also uh, CEO of Ben Gurion University. Um, and uh, he was killed immediately, and I became deputy uh, on that day. Um, Otherwise, he would have been sent on this mission? Otherwise, he would have been probably number uh, maybe six or seven. Um, yeah, you know, we don't know what would have happened. What was um, the estimate? There is, of course, no figure, no, no fact. But regarding the casualties in the mission beforehand? Um, the, uh, the operations research said two of the airplanes would be shot down. And obviously, Elon and myself thought that we were last in the row, we would be the guys to be shot down. Uh, not a great feeling to, to go along with. Because they would be ready for you by the time yeah. you got there. Uh, but that's, uh, you know, I remembered uh, what Benny Pellet told us. The former IF chief. Yes, he said, it's great to be a pilot during peacetime. Uh, it's shit during wartime. So nobody's going to pick you up if you parachute. Nobody's going to bring you back home. Don't expect it. And but the Iraqis were known for their graceful treatment of Israeli pilots. Yeah, we also had a joke that one of the guys, Dubi, was a very lucky guy, and he's going to be hanged at the center of Baghdad with a lot of TV, and we're going to be hanged on the side streets. No TV. Uh, so uh, we had this kind of macabre jokes. But, uh, yeah, they, these were trying times. Personally, you're flying in a single airplane. You don't share what you feel, your, your fears or whatever. Um, so and there's radio silence. Yeah, but I mean, true. But I, I mean, in the months before and before takeoff, it's not something you share how you feel. Uh, and during the flight itself, you're busy with the mission itself. And, and I can recall one uh, particular moment when um, the chief of staff after the uh, the uh, briefing in the morning of the flight. The chief of staff, whose yes. son was also a fighter pilot, yes. killed during this period. Yes, killed a, a, a little bit before that. He gave us a pack of dates each. He said, get used to the food. Not a great joke. Uh, and he said that this is a historic mission that is worth any casualty that might take place. You were also given Iraqi dinars. We were given Iraqi dinars so that if we have to parachute buy ourselves a donkey or something, because or a camel. Did you keep him a mentor? Uh, I didn't, but one of us did. And um, I remember that during that, uh, the, the end of the briefing, um, I had my grandfather before me came, came to me a, a, in a sense of, I'm going to fly for him, because he stayed in Vilnius while my father made Aliyah, came to Israel. And he was killed in the Holocaust. In Lithuania. Yes, in Vilnius. And um, my daughter is named after my father's sister. So I said, I'm flying for them. And if I come back, it's a bonus. And I think each one of us had that feeling that, yes, there's no turning back, no matter what happens. Now, you were, at the time, um, 28 yep. years old. And uh, your base commander a 40-year-old ace named Iftah Spector insisted on taking one of the pilot's uh, places. Yeah. Was it the right decision by him? It was his right decision. And I think he felt that 
the mission was, was dangerous and he felt that he couldn't send his pilots to a dangerous mission without taking part. <clears throat> I think it's a genuine, genuine feeling that he expressed at the time. I was, I personally taught him how to fly the F-16. I knew what he knows and what he doesn't. He was okay. Uh, for older pilots, it's difficult to transition to these airplanes. And I think that if I may use what he said afterwards, he said sometimes seven eighths are a hundred percent. Because he was the eighth guy and the only one who missed the, the target. True. But was it the right decision by his uh, superiors to allow him to do it? Uh, you know, many years after when I was a commander, uh, I, I could understand his feelings. Um, and I, I felt that I would do the same or I would try to do the same. Not out of vanity. Not out of vanity. It's out of the fact that uh, how can I send the people that I command and fly with every day uh, to a dangerous mission without putting my life at stake, sending them. It's, this is typical of the Air Force. I think we should be proud that that's the way our commanders feel. Whether his commanders should have let him fly is a different question that uh, I think we'll not have ever have an answer. Now, in the fighter pilot community, uh, your reputation, of course, uh, is of uh, perhaps the only ace in the world. At that time, you were certainly the only ace. Ace meaning someone who shot down at least five enemy planes, who uh, did it by flying the F-15 as well as the F-16, both uh, types of aircraft. Yeah. What was the most memorable dogfight that you can remember out of these five or more? I think uh, the flight during the 9th of July, which uh, I led a four ship of F-16s. Uh, it was the only four ship of direct bombing of uh, uh, SAMs, SA uh, an SA-2 and an SA-3. You mean June 9th, 19, 1982? 1982. Uh, we came behind from, the, from Syria. 19 SAM batteries were attacked simultaneously. Yes, that's true. And um, most of them, or all of them, were attacked with standoff uh, munition, except uh, for that four ship that, for some reason, they felt that uh, they needed a regular attack and uh, so I was leading that four ship and while we were approaching the target I could see that there were two MiG-21s uh, hovering above and uh, I made a decision that we could attack the, the, the missile sites and then get those MiGs with their 90 degree advantage on us which is exactly what happened um, and then uh, after coming out of the bombing, that was uh, uh, a lot of fire at that time. Uh, we came out, we got those MiG-21s on the attack, and I shot the flight lead, and my wingman shot the other guy. Did you and assign roles? Did you tell him you take yeah. the other one? Yes. Uh, one of the MiGs was trying to uh, get behind my friend Ronnie Falk, who was number three. Uh, and I shot him uh, from the belly. Um, and as we came out, I was asked for uh, uh, the results. And I remember I said uh, the, uh, the names of the, of the flight uh, was Negisha and Shogeg. And uh, I forget the other uh, call, name, sign. call sign. Uh, four alpha, two mix. You mentioned Ronnie Falk and uh, his brother Ehud was killed in another yeah. dogfight training. training. It's a very dangerous profession. You bet, yes. And Ronnie himself uh, was involved in a mid-air collision as well. And ejected. And ejected, lucky, and uh, is doing well today as well. Now, if you compare these experiences of air-to-ground in this mission as well as in Osirak and air-to-air, What's more exciting, more fulfilling for a fighter pilot? Um, By the way, what happened to the Syrian pilots? 
um, of the, the five airplanes that I shot, three of them ejected. Uh, and I felt I had a good feeling when they ejected. Um, I think a blend of air to ground and air to air is something that pilots dream about. Uh, the others were pure air to air missions. Um, I think it's, uh, it's decision making is difficult when to go into air to air because your mission is to destroy something on the ground. So being able to do them both, I think, was uh, probably the most fulfilling. Up to the mid 1960s, the Israeli Air Force was not so known. There were not too many uh, opportunities. Uh, for the uh, air-to-air winning ratio. But now we got used, perhaps complacent, if it's not 100 to 1, we think that there's a problem. Of course, this is, uh, can lead you to the wrong path because the way you should train and get yourself ready is to think about the other side having the same weapon systems as you have, electronic warfare within it that is going to block your GPS, it's going to block your radar, maybe, uh, and it's going to deceive you, jam your systems. Um, and, and you go back to flying by the seat of your pants, no fly-by-wire? Well, it's the airplane itself is fly-by-wire, but maybe no radar, maybe part of the information that you're used to is going to be very partial, it's going to be wrong, uh, and, uh, of course, it's a two-way street. So uh, give a lot of respect to potential enemy and train, as if the enemy has the same type of airplanes, the same type of munition, and be ready for it. And if it's not that way, it's a bonus. Now, taking into account the fact that um, your OSIRAC mission uh, and all eight of you came back uh, safely, as well as the uh, six F-15 uh, pilots who uh, covered you for uh, yeah. part of the way, that was a surprise for the Iraqis. It wasn't talked about um, beforehand in a way which could give them early warning. And that was also the case in 2007 in the uh, Syrian North Korean uh, reactor, a mission planned by one of your former subordinates, Amikam Norkin, now a major general and the Air Force chief. Um, and you actually plucked him out of uh, his squadron and took him to yours at one time. But now everyone talks about Iran. The Iranians know that we are probably planning to attack them. They know the Syrian and Iraqi examples. Could the Israeli Air Force do it again? You know, the difference between uh, assessing what you can do um, rightly and vanity is not great. Um, I think the Iranians have... Uh, planned their nuclear program in such a manner that it would take weeks, probably, of uh, intensive warfare to neutralize their capabilities for a long time. Um, it would take uh, uh, air superiority and would take bombing off well-dug uh, sites that are spread all over Iran. Uh, to make the blow such that it was irrecoverable. So um, I think the distance, and you know that the Israeli Air Force is not a strategic air force in the sense it doesn't have real bombers that can carry very heavy duty uh, bombs and so on. Uh, we should be more realistic about what can be achieved. We can really hurt them and make it painful, but it's not going to be a uh, showstopper of uh, one mission or eight airplanes or something like that. Um, so that would be a lot more complicated. And um, so I would think that uh, we should uh, keep this as secretive as we can, not to let the other side know what we can and what we can't do. But it's not going to be as simple as that. But nevertheless, if the uh, political decision is made, and as you say, it's not uh, a one day, one sortie, um, and uh, it's all over, uh, the Israeli public should be 
uh, expecting a longer few days, week or more uh, campaign, but then it is uh, feasible. It is feasible to a certain extent. Uh, we would probably pay a pretty high price. But uh, and the question would be whether it's uh, worthwhile or not. I think as a pilot, obviously it is worthwhile. This is what we're there for. Uh, you know, landing uh, after a mission is not a mission. The mission is to take out uh, the target. Time on target. Time on target. And coming back is a bonus. And we should think of it that way, that uh, as far as the Air Force is concerned, um, the target, if it is uh, important enough to take out, um, then the, tar- the Air Force knows how to channel its uh, energy towards that particular mission. So I would, I would say, yes, it's doable. A lot of damage uh, with a price that we have to be ready to pay. In the Six-Day War, the price was 10% yep. of uh, air crews, also aircraft, but aircraft, of course, are replaceable. Um, you mentioned the uh, estimate of the operations research experts of one quarter, two out of eight, uh, probably not coming back. So uh, this is the range um, in which one should expect casualties over Iran? At least, yes. At least one quarter. I would think so, yes. But now uh, we have um, a rescue uh, unit, which was under your command when yep. you, you were the commander of uh, Tel Nof base. They could pick up uh, some uh, ejecting pilots. Uh, that is true. And uh, obviously this would be planned and, and uh, made available. But um, we should look at a worst analysis case. <clears throat> and the worst analysis case would lead the thought of whether it's worthwhile or not. Um, you know, in the last few years, we're not ready. We're not really paying a high price for our security. Uh, but when you're thinking strategic, Remember the Second World War and the casualties then, 12 o'clock high, the movie, you know, et cetera. 40,000 uh, air crew over Europe, more than the ground troops. Yep. Um, and uh, we, we should understand that this may be the price and we should be able to pay this. Uh, the air crews know this and I think they're all ready to do this. This is part of their commitment and this is how we select them and indoctrinate them. So uh, there's no lack of will and ability within the Air Force. It's more of a political or or statesman type of decision making. These are all volunteers, of course, plus the ground crews, which are crucial. We see all around us in the Middle East air forces which crumble without contract uh, maintainers. Of course. But it seems as if um, had you been at least uh, advising the powers that be, that you would not uh, rush to recommend such a mission? Because it's always a question of what are the expected results, the best results you can expect, what will be the effect on the other side uh, versus worse case scenarios, uh, and then make a decision. Um, So, If the question would be, are there any other alternatives? Um, Can we align more air forces and more forces for a particular mission? Um, So it's a question of alternatives. At this point in time, I think I would not recommend. It would be a last resort. That would be a last resort, yes. Now, in the few minutes that we still have, uh, please go back to the flight academy, which you headed, and give us a few tips uh, for people who are now, let's say, teenagers and want to become fighter pilots in the Israeli Air Force. Um, The attitude, it's a question of attitude, and this is the way we look at cadets and also their friends when they write their sociometric readings already at the selection, their very early selection phase. Do the best you can so if you fail, you'll be complete with yourself. 
I did the best I could and I didn't make it. I don't have what they call the right stuff, either motorically um, or otherwise in ability to, to, to mesh in that amount of information and make the right decisions. Academically, you mean? Because now, of course, it's a three years. Yeah, um, not, the academic, academic. Not, not academically. But during the, 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 the selection phases, when you try to fly, uh, there's just so much that you can take in. And part of the selection is you fly with, and I used to fly with uh, those cadets in the selection phase and see how they think. Sometimes uh, people don't have the motoric capabilities. Sometimes they don't have the, the type of thinking um, that is required in the air of do different uh, um, uh, job parts, break up the job part of flying. Um, and so you do your best. And if your best is not good enough, you'll feel complete with yourself when you're selected out. You won't say, well, I could have studied a little more. I could have worked a little more. If you go on that mission, you'll be at peace with yourself when you make it or you don't make it. But it seems as if because of uh, economic uh, considerations, being the best is not enough because there is only a quota and the 20 or so best cadets get to graduate and the others uh, who are also excellent uh, have to wait uh, for another profession. You know, it's think of the uh, Olympics, 100 meter dash, there are eight runners there. And the guy who came in last hardly made it. I mean, 10.04 seconds for 100 meters. He doesn't know how to run, yeah. right? And number nine, didn't even make it to the finals. Is he not good enough? He's not good enough for that selection phase. Reserve General uh, Relic Shafir, um, and a very interesting conversation. Thank you very much, and thank you. We will be back for another episode of Watchmen Talk. Thank you.